It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Take Command Podcast, what's up? What's happening? That's Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman, and we have so much to talk about (laughs) because Adam Peters cannot stop making deals, Logan. 15 free agents. 15. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, but this is kind of what we thought, though. Are you, I mean, are, are you surprised by this? I'm not really, no. you know, like, yeah. No, I, like, I had this someone is late what last needed week. to happen, right? Like, yeah, no, totally. I had someone late last week tell me, yeah, you know, that they, they definitely like wanted to come in and review the roster. And when they did, they didn't really like what they saw. And I'm, in my head, I was like, oh, this is going to be a busy free agent period. Yeah. And sure enough, uh, it is very clear now that that person knew exactly what they were talking about uh, because it is it is very clear they're trying to flip this roster. I mean, you yeah. you take the 15 they've signed. We tend to think, we'll get into this, what what we still think they could do. But I, I would say like corner left tackle, as we sit here recording this at 9.45 a.m. on Thursday, like corner left tackle, um, you know, maybe there's a couple of other signings, wide receiver. Like this number gets up to 15, 18, eight or nine draft picks and some UDFAs wind up making the roster. And you're talking about literally flipping half to 53 in one year. Well, I mean, that's like what happens, you know, like when I was here with, uh, with Mike Shanahan in 2010, like basically like the roster flipped about 30 people in that off season, you know, like that, you know, and I, I wasn't, I was one of the people that was an add on, but I remember talking to some of the older guys and they're like, man, I don't know anybody on the team anymore. And like, that's just part of establishing a new culture, right? Like this team last year, you know, wasn't very good. And I think like there was some player issues, there were some coaching issues and, all that kind of stuff. And part of establishing a new culture is just bringing in new people, people that you can trust that are going to bring in the system. And I think that's what they're doing. I think they've identified guys that are smart, tough football players, guys that I enjoy watching that are, you know, some of these guys are limited. They're not necessarily the long-term answer, but I do think it's, it's kind of this identity shift. And I think that's, that's kind of what I expected. And I'm glad, I think the thing I'm glad about is that they've executed it so well right you know like they've trusted their evaluation they haven't gone out and overspent really it's been very consistent there's a couple guys you could argue like maybe that's a little bit too much whatever but i think it kind of all kind of follows the same kind of um theme and it's like find good football players for good value that have good roles in the defense and good roles in the in um in the uh, in the offensive perspective and i think that's what you get here so yeah definitely i i think that what you just said to 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 kind of underscore it and, and put some names behind it, like Adam Peters and his staff, um, you know, Lance Newmark and, and everybody else, they are doing such a good job executing what the coaches want. And sometimes yeah. it's as simple as like, you know, Anthony Lynn knows Austin Eckler and, you know, hey, that's the guy that he wants and you go get Austin Eckler. Sometimes it's, you know, maybe but DQ you, is like But Bobby you, get Wagner, you get him at a good yeah, number. You get him at a good number too. I think totally. that's the other and thing, so, right? Like, right. And so you get you get the right types of guys. It's like, hey, I need a so-and-so that does this. And Adam Peters and the scouts are like, okay, how's this guy? And coaches are clearly like, yep, that'll do. Right. And then they get him at the number. And I think that... That is not only an Adam thing uh, to be a good negotiator um, as the the lead guy, assuming that he's doing those negotiations. Um, maybe that's someone else on his staff is the negotiator guy. Um, but who how, whoever's doing that, excellent work out of you. Um, and and two, it's also the DQ effect. Like, let's be yeah. very real about this. Like, a lot of these players want to play for Dan. And yeah. I had a couple of people in my Twitter replies yesterday going, "Do you think that?" Ben Johnson or Mike uh, McDonald would get all these players. And, you know, I, I, I struggle with that because I think you do have to give a lot of credit to Adam and his staff as the GM, but I think the answer is no. Um, like I, I genuinely think that this is the power of a guy like Quinn, who's so well liked and so well respected and especially with these vets and we'll see, you know, there's going to be a bunch of young guys over the next bunch of years who don't know Dan Quinn, Seattle, or didn't, play for Dan Quinn Seattle like Bobby did um and we'll see how how long that lasts and winning tends to be the thing that draws people so if if they don't win then then the appeal uh goes down significantly but without doubting year one this is a huge huge DQ effect and some of the other guys on that staff who are well like like a cliff 
for a Zach Ertz, like an Anthony Lynn, et cetera, and on down the list. Well, I also think it's, you know, it's Dan Quinn effect, obviously, in terms of personnel, but I think it's the Dan Quinn effect, too, when it relates in, in regards to the coaching staff, too. I think he was able to go out and find guys like yeah. Cliff, like Anthony Lynn, get them in the building. And then um, those guys obviously have good relationships with the players that, like, in question, you know, like I know um, Cliff loves Zach and Zach loves Cliff, and that just doesn't happen, you know, by accident. That's because, Cliff understands how Zach works and Zach understands how Cliff works and you get this great relationship. And Anthony Lint has talked about his relationship with Austin Eckler and how much he appreciates him. So again, like he, as much as this is Dan, and I think it's a huge part, Dan, you know, when you hear Fowler talking about how he'd play for Dan for the rest of his life and like that's, right. that's a very telling statement. He's but sure it's trying, also, man. It's, it's also the other coaches too. You know, I think that's a big thing also here too. It's like the other coaches that he identified as people that fit his, his, cultural vision for the identity of this team and this staff have identified have also been uh, able to build good relationships with players over their tenure i think that's extremely important so yeah I, I absolutely i think this is a dan thing you know I, it's a dan thing in terms of how he constructs it, the staff his relationship with players and also i think when you look at the type of player that's coming in here it's it's very dan quinn it's very dan quinn and adam peters you know and i, and I think you hit it the nail on the head there perfectly there just seems to be a great synchronicity in terms of what they're getting from the GM and the coach, and I, and I like it. And it, is it all going to work out perfectly? I don't know, but at least the process so far has been one that I appreciate. And all these free agents coming in are not going to be perfect players. They're going to have their issues, but at least it's kind of it, it's 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 sticking to the script of how to be successful. We're not going out overspending in year one. We're not trying to go out and get a Brian Burns and break the bank and be yoked with that contract for the next four years. We're giving ourselves some flexibility. We're giving ourselves opportunity to build through the draft, identify talented draft, get the most talented players and go from there. So that, that's always an exciting proposition. Yeah, we were having this conversation on the radio show yesterday and Anthony was like, well, what do you think about when it, the draft and you know, best player available versus need? And I was like, I think the... A free agency is for needs and the draft is for best player available. Like you get your studs, yeah. you get your blue chippers in the draft and they don't always have to be first rounders. Obviously you're very much hoping that your number two overall pick is, um, but you can find guys later in the draft if you put them in the right positions and develop them properly. Um, and that's, that's what you want, but you can't take those swings and those chances if you just need a guy to play. And yeah. what the commanders have already done with this free agency period, with the exception of a few positions that we'll kind of circle back around to at the end of the podcast, is they've gotten enough guys to play. Like, they can field a team. And uh, this time last week, granted, they hadn't had the opportunity to do this yet because the league, you know, the, the tampering period and, and now officially free agency hadn't opened yet. But they, didn't, they couldn't field a team last week. Um, and, and now we got that, obviously, as a, as, as a thing that's going to happen. Yeah, All right. and I, uh, I just want to say this too. Like, I think yeah. there's a reason that, like, I do, I do mock drafts for my ticket to the draft podcast. We do mock drafts here. There's a reason that prior to free agency, we were always drafting the same positions. And now, like, it's just like, hey, I don't need to worry about defensive end. I don't need to worry. I still need to worry about tackle, but I don't, I can be a little bit more selective and a little bit more eclectic in terms of talent, right? Maybe there is a receiver at the top of the second who I just think is to die for. Now I don't need to worry about drafting a linebacker. It, it just gives you such flexibility to get, again, a piece that fits, a talented piece that fits your vision and fits your culture in a way that you couldn't before. Like you maybe had to reach on a guy like Patrick Paul at the top of the second round. You know what I mean? Like with, with that 30, 36 or 40th pick, and that still might be an issue. I don't think it will be. We'll talk about that more in a second. But I think they've done a good job of kind of erasing some of these needs at linebacker and edge to give you some flexibility. So... Yeah, well, let's go to let's flush that out because now we're eight and a half minutes into this this segment, if you will, of the podcast, and not that podcasts really have time constraints. But uh, since we're already here, um, we'll we'll get to Bobby Wagner and go down the list uh, of guys here in a second. But I think when you talk about how it affects the draft, this also I would say strengthens my position that they are going to trade one of these first top five picks. I would be very surprised still if it's two, but. Um, and, and I've said this a ton and, and maybe some people haven't heard this yet, but, um, like I talked about this with Linnell yesterday, the idea that you have to package 36 and 40 together to get up into the twenties is not how the math works. The Jimmy Johnson mm. trade chart is what everybody uses still to try to figure out the trades or some version of it. And if you package 36 and 40 together, you're not getting to 22, you're getting to like 13. And so if you want to go up and get a top flight left tackle at 13 and sacrifice those two picks, I think that's feasible. Like I would mm. consider doing that. 
um, and trading way back into the first round in a way that like Houston did like last year, obviously to an extreme because they traded up you know, to take two of the first three picks. Washington, I guess, technically has that ammo. I don't know that I would use that. You're talking about sacrificing a future first at that point, and I don't, I don't know that I want to do that. Um, and but in let I don't know. Maybe if you look at Arizona and you're like, or New England, and you're like, hey, we want to get Drake May, add Marvin Harrison Jr. Like, could you? I guess. But I think more realistically, you package 36 and 40 together and you say, let's go get JC Latham or uh, hmm. uh, Fuaga or w- someone like that. Or that, that, whatever. Yeah, yeah, whoever it is. Yeah, whichever tackle falls into that that you know 10 to 15 category, you could do that if you wanted to. Um, you could also package 36 and uh, 100 for uh, like 29. Right. Yeah. And you go back and say Lad McConkey falls and you love him out of Georgia. And you're like, that dude is going to be a Cliff Kingsbury star and a, and a young quarterback's best friend because he's a great inside route runner who just gets open all the time. You could, you could make that move. Yeah. And I, I think th- why you felt like you couldn't before free agency is you needed the dudes. Like you literally mm. needed the number of players like to just be able to people, field the like team. bodies. Yes. Just needed exactly. human beings. You, yeah. You needed. You know, human beings that could play NFL football <laughs> pretty immediately, and you can get those in the first two rounds, and right. they're not going to be great necessarily if they're second rounders. Um, but now you have that flexibility to say, if we really like a guy, we don't need to come out of the first two rounds with a quarterback, a defensive end, at a tackle because we need all three positions. You don't yeah. anymore. You don't need a defensive end in the way that you did, and thus, if you want to take a higher quality tackle you have the freedom to do so. You do. And I think it just, it goes back to like, obviously that's a tool that could be utilized here, right? But maybe you are right. feeling good about sitting at those, at 36 and 40, because you think maybe. there's going to be kind of those residual first round guys there, you know? And then maybe they kind of, the way you tear out the top, you know, 40 picks, you're like, man, we're going to be happy with two players here. And who knows? I'm not saying, but it's all, we're all, yeah. it's all speculation. It is a possibility for sure. But I, I think it's, it's a good insight. And it just, again, it gives you more flexibility, ability, it makes you more dynamic in the draft. And it allows you to get, you know, people talk about New England having 20 people on your their draft board or 25 people, whatever that that legend is, right? So that's only 25 draftable players. You know, now if that's how they operate their draft board here, I don't think that's how they do it. But if they wanted to, we could be more selective about the guys we're trying to pick and say, these are the guys that fit us to a T as opposed to kind of this general buckshot approach. Let's be more specific. Let's be more surgical. And I think there's value there too. I, you know, I wouldn't personally do that, but I could see the value of doing that. If you say, man, we love JC Latham. We love Amarius Mims. And we think he's the guy for the future for us. Then make that decision and trade those two picks. Right. And so I think that's kind of, it, totally. again, it just lets you be flexible. So. Right. And as, as a, you, you said really well there, that's an option. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, you get say say there's a dude that you just love that falls and and it wasn't in a position that you were really considering. Right. And now you don't feel the pressure to uh, not take him because you did the other stuff in free agency. Uh, so with that, let's get into what they have done so far. And we're going to go uh, chronologically in reverse here because I think the last move is the biggest. signed Bobby Wagner to a one-year deal. He is still one of the best middle linebackers in football. PFF had him ranked as their second highest graded linebacker against the run last year. Still a very good coverage player. Obviously, the brains of many terrific operations over the years. A true Mike linebacker who can do it all. And I did not think this was coming, Logan, because they signed Frankie Louvu earlier in free agency. And I was like, he had the green dot last year in Carolina. He played well with it. Um, that's the guy that they're going to stick next to Jamin Davis, but now they, they got Luvu and Wagner and Davis and, and suddenly the, the second level of this defense has speed, smarts, aggression, know-how it's got everything. How does it all fit together? Yeah, I think that's going to be the million dollar question, quite honestly, is like what this what this ultimately looks like. And I think, you know, Bobby Wagner, like you said, is still an excellent football player against the run. But, you know, father time is undefeated. He's lost a little bit in coverage. Not that he's bad, but just lost a little bit in coverage. Can't do the same things he used to. But excellent football player. And I think the thing you get is even with Luvu, a guy that's like probably in year, what is it, year five or six at this point? You And Jamin, too, going into year four. What is it, year four or five for him also? Yeah. Four. The, I think the ability to have a veteran in the room 
to kind of mentor some of those guys, I think is extremely important. You know, just kind of show you, show what it means to be a professional. And one of the things that I thought the last staff kind of overlooked is they overlooked the value of like veteran leadership. And if you look at these signings, right, you get a, a veteran tight end who's and like I, I like Logan as a veteran. But he was like relatively new to the position. And now you get Zach Ertz, a guy who's done it all right at every level with multiple teams and, and really has fleshed out his process. And then you look at Austin Eckler in the running back room. Apparently, he's just like the ultimate grinder, the ultimate professional when it comes to getting himself ready to go. So now you get B-Rob a model. You know, maybe he's not mentoring B-Rob on the day to day, but he gets a model right of, of how to be a professional. I think that is so, so valuable. Now you add Bobby Wagner, not only for the linebackers, but for the whole defense, a guy that again is like borderline hall of fame type player. And I just think getting those pieces and they're not on long-term deals. They're not, I don't think part of the vision long-term. I think they could be, if they do well this year, you could sign an extension, whatever it looks like. But I think it helps establish that culture. Like this is who we want to be. We want to be excellent. This is how we prepare. This is how we take care of our bodies and getting guys like that in the building adds value there. And you know, like when I was in, in Atlanta with Dan, one of the things he was always talking about, it's like, we as coaches can set the standard, but the players have to enforce it. And I feel like you've gotten a bunch of guys who can enforce it. So while I think Bobby Wagner is going to be an excellent football player, I think his, his the thing that's almost invaluable, invaluable about the signing is his ability to kind of just say, hey, this is the standard for us defensively. And Dan doesn't have to do it. He can do that. I think that's great. So with regards to actual usage patterns, I've heard everybody speculating on this. It's way 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 too early for that because like one of the things about dan in the defense if, especially if you watch him in dallas the evolution based on the personnel he had available was was kind of the thing that made it awesome so one year they've got three linebackers on the field a ton one year they've got anthony Barr rushing the passer and two linebackers right and then this last year it's a whole bunch of nickel players so i think he, what the thing that's beautiful about dan and hopefully wit is that they're going to say this is what these guys are good at how do we maximize everybody, right? How do we kind of put these guys in the best position to be successful? You know, Chin, I think, is another great example. Like, he's a great yeah. movable piece in the defense. And so how do we maximize all these pieces and get the best version of the defense? So I think that's the thing that I'm excited for is just the flexibility that all these signings give you, you know? And having Wagner in there, again, it's in the same way that that the draft, they now have flexibility in the draft. They have flexibility at the linebacker position because now maybe Luvu, we like him as a third down pass rusher in this sub package of our defense. I don't have to worry about, you know, who do we put at Mike? Like maybe that's Bobby or maybe it's Jamin or maybe Jamin is kind of playing an over, whatever it looks like. We now have flexibility to kind of make some of these decisions and maximize all these personnel acquisitions. Yeah, I, I talked about this with Bullock the other day on the the YouTube live that we then put here in the uh, in the take command feed. But you kind of have this uh, this rotating cast of characters uh, that that are going, and you know now I think we can see the the thing that they're rotating around. Right, if this is a galaxy or a universe yeah. or whatever the solar system of of talented multi and I'm, I'm using uh the word versatile to avoid position flex because position <laughs> flex is scarring for people but like positionally versatile players they have to rotate around something there has to be something that is like the constant bobby yeah. wagner to me is the constant he is the guy that is going to be out there every single snap giving everybody direction but then you think of who else is out there luvu is a movable chess piece Chin is a movable chess piece. Jamin, to an extent, is a movable chess piece. Uh, Quan is a movable chess piece. Right. Almost every single defensive lineman they have that's not Big Phil is a movable chess piece on right. some level. Um, you know, a guy like Fowler, maybe it's, you know, is he uh, five to all the way out to like a wide nine? Is he in the hand in the dirt? Is he standing up? Like there's there's odd, different ways you can rush him. And he's obviously played with Dan and has probably moved around and maybe he's rushed from the inside. John and Duran haven't done it a lot, but they can rush from the outside if you want to create the right matchups there. And those still are your studs. For all the guys they've brought in, those are probably the two most talented defensive linemen you have Dorrance Armstrong inside outside flexibility. Um, you know, all, all these other guys, Cleveland Furl, um, hard edge setter, maybe not a ton of pass rush juice, but is strong enough to play inside outside and a, and a variety of different, you know, alignments from a, a tackle position or sorry, an edge position. So you have all of these movable pieces that now you kind of need a conductor to change metaphors completely. You need a conductor to be able to keep everybody on task. Bobby Wagner, as good of a conductor as there is in the NFL. 
Yeah, and I think I think that's exactly right. And I also think like he doesn't. I think that's the thing when you look at Kyle Van Oy, Like he was kind of that piece for them last year. There's times where he's off the field because you have a guy like Luvu who can step in in certain situations. And again, the diversity that it brings, the consistency that it brings, and the professionalism that, that this type of signing brings, I think is huge. So you know, I think it's awesome. And I think the thing that I'm most excited about is like. When they start practicing, like, what does this sucker look like? Who, what are these roles? Who, who's where? What is their vision for these guys? And I think that's the thing that I'm, I'm most excited about because, again, they have, they have, you have guys who are smart defensively on that side of the ball. You have a guy um, in Wagner who can help execute that vision. And what, what comes out of this thing, you know? Because, I, like I said, Van right. does a great job of every year kind of saying, "Oh, this guy doesn't do this super well. Let's let's find a way to maximize him. Let's put him in a better spot. Let's put this guy in a better spot." And I, I just can't wait to see what that looks like. So, yeah, for sure. And to go back to kind of the the larger picture here, um, you know, when you build something, uh, and all, all the contractors listening, hopefully, I don't mess this up. But like, first step is the foundation, right? And years from now, when you have this really fancy house that hopefully hopefully has a big sign out front that says Super Bowl champions, right? Like that's the ultimate goal. There's a layer of concrete and that is underneath it all that you don't see anymore. But everybody who knows anything about anything knows it's the most important yeah. piece. Because if that's not there, the whole thing collapses. And guys like Wagner and Ertz, who will most likely not be there uh, by the time this thing hits its peak and is is at completion, um, they're, they're essential pieces. And so mm -hmm. I, th I think that that foundational level of this is what it means to be a pro, this is how we do things as Washington commanders moving forward, and reestablishing what that means is enormous. And Wagner is as good of a guy, uh, as well as Ertz, and we'll talk about Mariota in a second, um, all these different guys that are, that are in on that level. And I'm really, really glad you said that because while these are exciting signings, they are the base. Like this team isn't going to go out and be amazing. Like I don't expect them to go out and be amazing, but I expect them to go out and be competitive. And that's the first step, right? Be yeah. competitive each and every week. Like kind of like just to draw a weird comparison here, but like Arizona was last year. Like they, I don't know what their final record was, but whatever, five and 12, whatever it was. Yeah. But they were competitive in every single game that they played. And this is the foundational element of that, of establishing that winning identity. And I think having guys like that, again, like they're not going to be here when you put the window frames up and everything, you put that sign in the front yard, they're not going to be here for that. But this is a integral part of getting that established. So, well, let me ask you this, like when you, cause you were a part of this in San Francisco, you're yeah. somewhere beneath the house in, in San Francisco as, as a piece <laughs> of the foundation. Like, do you see things that you guys yeah. established in 2017 when you watch them playing in the Super Bowl uh, a couple of times over the past few years, even if it hasn't, they haven't gotten to hang the champion sign yet. They've been the best team in the NFC over the last, what five six years and you yeah. were there when when it started so what do you see how do you see those things ultimately playing out in the long term so one of the things that i think i see you know that you see at the highest level with san francisco is just how they how physical they are and how competitive they are and so i look back to those signings of guys they brought in they were guys that again like malcolm smith you know no one remembers him being part of san fran or um brock coyle was the other guy like just guys that were good professional football players and that became everyone's expectation after that year it's like we're going to study film we're going to stay after we're going to make sure we do our lifts we're going to be on time for meetings and that was the foundational element right of just tough and I, and I look at a lot of these signings and they're very very similar they're guys again that might not be here long term but they're going to be here to kind of say hey young guys everybody in this building like this is how we do things and that again allows you to kind of lay that lay that piece of concrete down and say this is now we can stand on a good surface and start building or start, you know, moving forward the way we want to move forward. And again, it took them probably two years before it like fully clicked in before the rock, before the talent caught up with the mentality that, they, that they'd established. And I think that's kind of what I'm expecting here too. Like it's going to be solid, a very competitive team, much like Carolina or much like uh, Arizona, but as the roster, as you build through talent and as you identify talent and free agency in the draft over the next two or three years, then the team's going to come together because you've got this really good like culture. I, I know people hate that word, but this really good cultural foundation that everybody's a part of. And I think that's that's why this is so I think it just feels so similar to that, which gets me really excited. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's then get into some of the other defensive guys and then let's swing over to the offensive side. And we've touched on this on a super duper high level, uh, but you got Chin, uh, you got Furl, you got uh, 
you know, re-signing Jeremy Reeves, which is huge for special teams, but also gives you some depth. Uh, you have, uh, who else on the, uh, Luvu, uh, Armstrong, um, who we talked about a little bit already, but like, what do you see starting to come together on the defensive side? And are there any of those guys that really stand out to you beyond Wagner? Yeah. So I think the whole, I, I mean, Luvu, like when you watch the film, man, gosh, like he just jumps. He's got a chance to be like a part of the talent. I think so. I mean, I think when you look at this list, there's three guys that really stick out to me. It's Luvu, Armstrong, and then uh, the center, Biotish, I think, right? Those guys, based on contract structure, based on the film, you say they, these guys, like Armstrong is a great example. He was in it. He's a talented guy. I've always liked his film. Very good situational pass rusher, but kind of a limited role. What does he project now that he's getting more snaps? And I think that's kind of what you're looking at here. And then Luvu, I mean, Luvu played almost every snap for them, so it's not the, quite the same thing. But gosh, just like a cultural piece in terms of play style that gets you really fired up, right? And obviously things happen, things change, but same thing. And then Biotish, again, is a consistent player that's a, that is going to, again, like does the right things, decent athlete, not a perfect player, but good football player. So those are the kind of the three guys of that group. Obviously, one guy from offense there. You say, those feel like moving forward, talented pieces that um, that are going to be part of maybe part of when the signs hanging on the door in a couple of years. Um, to you, are they done at defensive end, or do they need more? Like, are you interested in bringing in like Jadeveon Clowney still out there? And I don't know if he's a, a Dan Quinn guy. I don't know enough about him personally. That's not to say yeah. that he's not. But like, if they say yes, cultural fit, and he would he fit in Baltimore last year, which is certainly something. Um, like, would you be wanting to bring in someone like that? Are you draft or are if they line up and it's Dorrance Armstrong, Cleveland Furl with Dante Fowler in a rotation, uh, and KJ Henry and Andre Jones along with you know, the, the D tackles that they got, is that good enough for that D line room? Yeah. I mean, I definitely think they want to add more pieces. I think when you look at what made Dallas so excellent last year, obviously they got Michael Parsons, but they had four, five guys that could really, really rush the passer at a high level. And I think you just can't overstate the importance of pass rushers in this defense and what it does for the back end, right? Because they don't need to blitz a ton. They have guys that are creative, have that good, that kind of je ne sais quoi as a pass rusher, the feel, the bend, the handwork, right? And so I think they've got three guys that are pretty good, but I want more. And I think Dan wants more too. So if there's an opportunity to sign Genevieve Clowney or Kyle Van Oy, for an example, another a veteran piece that, you know, is in here on a one-year deal that's going to be that understands their role and maximizes the other guys. I think absolutely. And then I don't even think that precludes you from drafting a guy. Like I think you, you can never, if you look at good defense in the NFL, you can never have too many good pass rushers. Like you just can't. And so if there's a guy that you think for this year is going to help get you done and help you kind of establish that culture element, get him in here. If there's a guy at 36 that you think has got some pass rush juice, like Noah Ellis, who again, a lot of people aren't super high because he's undersized, but that dude's got some pass rush juice get him in here because defensively like that's what makes this whole thing go that's what made dallas go right we just could throw that's what made seattle go when he was in seattle and they were really rolling they literally had a hockey rotation of pass rushers it's like oh you guys are a little bit tired here's four more dudes right and like right. they're all really right. good you know so so i think yeah, that's no, so dude. absolutely absolutely more pass rushers get as many as you can if the <laughs> price is right get them in here uh, and then the the one area though where I still think that there is a huge need is corner um, yeah. because the other way that this all works together is that the rush and the coverage marry and you need a you need a good enough back end for that to work and I, obviously Forbes I think is going to be a starter uh, is is the former first rounder and the ball hawk and and all of that but I don't still we still don't know what they think of BSJ we don't know what they how they're going to use Quan Martin. Um, you know, obviously they get Chin, who I, it was described to me uh, by someone down in Carolina as much more of a box player. But yeah. um, you know, obviously he's a safety, so he'll wind up over the top some. Um, but like to me, that is that is the area that is is still a huge area of need. And I think what's interesting is that that left tackle, which we'll talk about when we get to the offensive side, those markets haven't moved at all. Like right. most of the big players at those positions haven't signed. Like Kendall might be the top corner available, and he hasn't sign you haven't heard anything really about him yet so where does that leave you in terms of corner and and maybe some of the guys available again we're taping this we're now at uh almost 10 15 a.m on thursday because the nature of podcasting is you say something and then something else happens before you actually get it to the ears of the people but uh you know jordan lewis and stefan gilmore played for dan 
in Dallas. You got a bunch of other guys still out there as well. Um, where are you at on on the back end of this defense? Yeah, so I think, you know, if I'm Dan, I look at BSJ, I look at Quant, uh, Forbes, and I think they're really talented pieces. You know, I, I, they, they are physically very gifted. And I'm if I'm Dan, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I, if I, I should stop saying Dan. If I'm Wit, I'm very optimistic that I can maximize those guys. Given my track record of doing that with guys that were – you know, a little, little different stylistically, you know. Um, what was the guy who had six interceptions last year for Dallas? Um, whatever. Uh, Jerome Bland. Yeah, yeah, Bland, right? Like, he's a six-round pick. Like, I'm very confident that I can take traits and maximize them. But I totally agree with you. I think they definitely need to get another corner in here. I don't know stylistically what they're looking for. Obviously, I love Kendall. I think he had a, he had a you know, in terms of years last year, he had a very good year. You know, I just think it's interesting that he hasn't signed yet. Maybe he's looking for more money or maybe he's just letting the market kind of unfold but if they brought him back i think that'd be great gilmore would be great because of the familiarity with with uh with dan and, and wit and all the defensive staff here but i definitely think they need somebody and you know traditionally they like guys that are a little bit aggressive tall long lean guys that have long arms that can use that length to make up for some of their footwork shortcomings and so i look at that and i say is there anybody on the market like that no one pops off the page necessarily to me, but that doesn't mean they don't have somebody on the radar that they're, they're, they're really stoked about. But I definitely think you need to get a corner in here. He needs to be a really good football player because much like the linebacker, much like the defensive line group, you just can't go in with kind of, you just need that kind of veteran presence in there. And I think especially that's especially important for both players. It's important for Forbes and it's important for BSJ. You just need that presence in there to kind of guide and mentor that group. So. Yeah, Kendall's interesting to me because I love Kendall as well and I've really enjoyed covering him twice now. Um, but I like he doesn't scream Dan Quinn player to me. Like he's got his really calm demeanor. Um, you know, he's not like a huge physical hitter. And, and so while he's a great technician, he plays with tremendous anticipation. And I would love to see a lot of those traits under Joe Witt and and the crew that they've assembled there defensively. I don't know that he screams like what the new identity of the team is, even if I like him a lot and would like, like wouldn't blink twice if he came back. Yeah, no, I, I agree. This I feel the same way. And I do think they like, if I was Dan, if I was wit, if I was the defensive back coach, I would love his anticipatory ability, right? Cause he does have a good feel of playing the ball route concepts. He plays with great technique and that's awesome. But the other thing I think that's important just to talk about here is this defense was bad last year. And while he was a very good player on a bad defense, like, there's something to be said for cultural turnover, you know, for getting yes. new people and new ideas in here. And I think that's not Kendall's fault. And I th hopefully he finds an opportunity. If he is back here, fantastic. But they might be looking at it that way. Like, is there a guy like, like a Stefan Gilmore, who again is not from here, from a winning culture, from a defense that he has familiarity with the defense already, that can come in and kind of, kind of show, show what we need in the same way you're getting Zach to do Bobby, Eckler like you know what I'm saying so I think yeah. that that's something that needs to be acknowledged here it's not like a knock on Fuller's play it's just a uh, when you're when you're kind of doing a a renovation of a team that's a huge element in terms of kind of getting what you want from a mentality standpoint at each position well especially because Quan and Forbes are like two essential pieces like you want right. the same vet in the room no you want a yeah. new vet in the room to help change that over so um I think that's really well put Let's go on the offensive side of the ball to wrap things up, Logan, which includes a couple of interesting names brought in that we haven't talked about yet, as well as the biggest hole remaining for sure on this roster. We'll close there in a second at left tackle. But um, what do you think of uh, Austin Eckler coming in here? Obviously, we talked about kind of the foundational type of pieces. I think he hits a lot of those notes. The familiarity with Anthony Lynn. And, uh, but a guy that a couple of years ago was still one of the best running backs in the NFL. How does he, how does he mix with and potentially even push Brian Robinson if he's healthy? Um, obviously if he's lost a step, he's going to slide into that backup role and that, that becomes pretty easy, but yeah. let's play a, what if game, let's play a little bit of optimism. What if Austin Eckler's healthy and is still Austin Eckler? What does this, what does this look like in that running back room? Yeah. I mean, I think that when you watch the film of 2023, like, you know, yet I think in, early in the season, he looked very explosive. Obviously he has that ankle injury and looks like it slows him down a little bit. He's an interesting player. Cause I think he does have good, like line crossing ability, like kind of vertical North South speed and ability to break tackles. But we, you know, he's always been characterized as this great pass receiver and he does catch the football really well, but he's not like this twitched up route runner. So I'm kind of 
curious to see like what they do with him. Cause like, you know, like when, like when I think of a run running running back, I think of like Christian McCaffrey, you know, a guy that can line up in the slot and run routes and do some things. And there's other guys in the league like that. Aaron Jones, great example. Eckler isn't quite on that same level. So he's a good pass protector, hard runner, good vision. Um, and he still has some explosive ability if he's healthy. So I don't know. I'm really curious to see how they do use him. And I ultimately, I think, I just think it's great. I really think it's awesome for Brian Robinson and um, uh, Chris Rodriguez. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying either one of those guys is a lock to make the team or anything like that, but I just think they have having someone in the room like that is so powerful to motivate and push and get the most out of guys. Cause like, you know, the status quo, like if they had re-signed Antonio Gibson, I just think it kind of ends up being the same type of feel, but now new blood kind of unsettle the room a little bit and it's going to force guys to step up and improve. And I think, um, I, I do think the staff is going to be pleasantly surprised with, with the athleticism and the power that B Rob does have. And I know they've done a self scout, so I think they're aware of it, but I think seeing in a person is going to be different. And I think Eckler again is a guy that gives you some security and insurance. And again, a maturity about the position that'll be nice for that room. So. Yeah. I mean, I, but I, I think to your point, like the pass catching element on third down, like, do you need to necessarily go out and line up in the slot and route somebody up? No. Can you be an effective outlet? And do you like reliably catch the swing pass when it's thrown to you as a check down? And then can you make guys miss and get yards in the open field? And that's kind of where Eckler's been great. Um, obviously also very good as a runner has led the NFL in touchdowns, uh, over a wide stretch of years, uh, earlier in the decade. But he is a guy that is reliable as a pass catcher where you're not, you know, if you throw it to him, he'll catch it and then you'll see what he does, even if he's not going to line up in the slot and have some of the the flexibility that an Antonio Gibson had, nevertheless, a, yeah. a Christian McCaffrey. Um, I'd also, you know, think that he's probably pretty reliable at this stage of his career as a pass blocker, I'd hope. Um, yeah, and so that that third down role is kind of, I think, what at this point in his career he's best suited as. But is you know if if all of a sudden B Rob misses a game like can he step in as a first and second down back can he be your primary guy if he's healthy absolutely but I also love your point about shaking up the room too and it's kind of the same thing we just talked about with Kendall at yeah. corner is like if B Rob has AG behind him then he's knows that he's RB one if you got Austin Eckler behind you like you're gonna make sure that you do everything right. no stone unturned and that's that's kind of necessary I think at times in the NFL. Yeah, just to be clear, like with the the pass catching thing, like I always think the way I, if Logan Paulson's an offensive coordinator in the NFL, I want a guy that I can use as a true mismatch weapon. And when in, in you know in uh, in LA when he was with the Chargers, like he's more of a checkdown guy, which again there's value there. He does a good job on screens, like there's value there too. It's not you know maybe this high end you know, offensive weapon thing, but he is an explosive guy who does well catching the football. So it's just his role. I don't want fans to think like, oh, we got this great elite kind of miss. We can line him up all over the floor. That's not really what he does, right? He's good in those other areas that you described, which again are valuable to the offense, specifically on third down, especially when you're in a lot of five man pro, like there's a little outlet running a swing pass back's going to catch it. He'll get you five. We can live with that. Oh, it's a hot answer versus a blitz. Or, hey, we got a screen set up. He does a great job with the timing and rhythm of those opportunities. So I think just to be clear about what I was explaining yeah. there, there's value to what he does. It's just not – I think a lot of fans hear pass catching running back and they think, oh, he's going to be – oh, all over the – he's a receiver. Da, da, da. But yeah, no, he's what Chris Thompson different. used to be. Like you line yeah. him up outside and yeah. he can do some things. It's not not who he is. Not quite like that, yeah. 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 Um, other big backfield move is Mariota. Um, mm -hmm. And this, I think, I don't say it came out of nowhere. It shouldn't have, uh, in, in hindsight, especially because a lot of these, the higher coaches Isn't that on funny staff how that goes? Isn't that funny? You're like, I should have seen this from like a mile away, but I didn't yeah. see it. Yeah. So Lynn gets Eckler. DQ now has, uh, has Bobby. You know, you got uh, different guys on the D-line that are kind of Quinn guys, uh, some of the secondary guys, maybe your Joe Wick guys or whatever. Um, but... Brian Johnson, assistant head coach, his guy's Mariota. He was with him last year in Philly. And you're like, right. duh. Um, duh. That, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think that Mariota is uh, maybe the most controversial signing so far, mm -hmm. um, in part because he's your quarterback, right? Like He's the guy that currently probably sits at QB1 in the room, pending what happens at number two. We, I think a lot of us think that whoever they take it to might not ultimately be ready to start week one and thus Marcus Mariota might be your week one starter next year and I also think that when we think of like veteran quarterbacks 
that's not the first guy that comes to mind because of how things went down at the end of his time in Atlanta. Now, I would say that that was a very complicated situation. Um, There's injury. Uh, he had just had a child and the ability to go and be a father um, and get recover from knee surgery. Like, I don't blame him at all for that. It clearly wasn't greatly communicated. Also seems like communicating with Arthur Smith is challenging at times. <laughs> um, so I don't, we don't know what went on there beyond what we learned from Netflix um, and, and the quarterback show. But at, at the end of it, um, what do you make of Mariota as you know, the guy to come in and be the vet in the room, what you've heard about him as, as a guy, as a mentor, as a leader, and how he fits with what you think Brian Johnson, Anthony Lynn, Cliff Kingsbury, all putting together with this offense. Yeah, you know, it depends on who you talk to, but I've heard that he's relatively well liked, you know, when on the teams that he's played for and what he's done. So I think that's that's good. You know, in terms of playing and play style, I'm not sure that he like blows the doors off necessarily. Like he's a backup quarterback for a reason. Like um I think he can run an offense. I think the um I think the ability to run the football from the quarterback spot is extremely important. I think when you look at what he did in Atlanta, like that was the thing that took that running game from I think they were 21st you know, to kind of a top five thing is just having the ability to move that guy around. So I think that's like his superpower. And if you have a staff that understands that and can maximize that, great. And I think, you know, obviously uh, Brian Johnson like knows him and understands what he brings. So I'm going to defer to him. But I think it's not like he's a he's a good backup guy. He's been around in multiple offenses. He can communicate well. I think he's going to be a good fit for room. And that's kind of what I what I view the signing. I don't think you need to extrapolate anything more than that, right? Like I know the name is gets people excited. Former second, former was he the first pick overall, second overall, whatever second. he was. He was. It was him and Winston. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, but yeah, I think you, you know, like I, I personally, I like Jacoby Brissett better, but I do think there's value to what Mariota brings, and I think in this spread kind of air raid system, he's had a lot of experience with it. So, or versions of it. I know we're kind of getting away from that terminology, but I think he has some experience with some of the concepts that, that Cliff is familiar with. So. Yeah, um, I agree with you on Brissett, but uh, I would, you know, that might have been a Brissett decision that he wanted yeah, to go right. to New England where he's like, yeah, I think that I'm probably going to be able to start here. <laughs> um, and depending on what the conversations were, and, you know, that's what I wonder about a guy like Tannehill, who I would have really liked to see here. Um, you know, was he told like, no, nah, we can't guarantee you anything. And he was like, no, I'm going to go find somewhere. Um, you know, Gardner Minshew goes to yeah. Las Vegas because he's probably going to be the starter week one. Um, so there, there's a lot of, I think of that kind of the players have a choice in free agency, uh, element to this as well. Um, are you going to let me have a little talk radio fun here? Sure. What do you want to do? I think Sam Howell's a better quarterback if he's got to play than Marcus Mariota, uh, right. at this stage of their careers. So what do we do with that information? If you agree? You know, I don't know if that's super hot takey because I definitely think at this point in their careers, Sam is throwing the ball a little bit better. Right. Than, than I think Marcus it's actually Mariota. more interesting because it's not like the analysis piece that Sam is better than Marcus is not that hot takey. Yeah. It's just like, what yeah. do you do with that information? Like, what does it mean that gets uh, a little hairy? I mean, I think you always want to keep good football players around. And I think there was a period of time where, you know, I had talked to some people at the comment. They're like, oh, I'd give a third round pick for Sam. You know, they're like, oh, well. I would take that, you know, because that's good right, value. Right. And especially if I'm Adam Peters, I'm not tied to the player. But I think after the 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 Mac Jones thing and how that's kind of matriculated away um, in terms of the value of these kind of backup style quarterbacks, I don't think you're going to get that from them. And for for Sam, and I think you keep him on the roster. And again, I want good football players. And I think when you look at uh, who said this, a GM who used to be in Philadelphia, I forget his name, but he's like, I I always want to make sure we develop quarterbacks because those are assets that have tremendous value, right? So either I can trade right. that asset if it develops or he starts and we win football games. So at this point, unless the price is right, I'm like, I actually don't hate what Sam is doing. I don't hate his physical skill set. I, you know, obviously there were points last year where it got really rough for him and he couldn't figure it out, but I think the highs were definitely starting caliber, you know? And I think it's right. the same thing. It's the same thing that Las Vegas is going through with O'Connell right now. It's like, you don't want to get rid of that asset unless you're getting something you deem equally as valuable in return. So based on what happened with Mac Jones, I don't think he leaves. I think he's here. And I think I feel pretty good about that because I think it's an opportunity for him to continue to develop and become something that um, can be pretty impactful down the road. Kind of like, I hate to say this is maybe high end, but like Geno Smithish, where he sits for a couple of years, finds an opportunity and then ends up starting some games at some point down the road. So, yeah, I, I think the question becomes like, what happens if in training camp, it is clear that currently going into week one, Sam Howell, who you anticipated being QB three is the best quarterback to win you football games. 
And that's where I wonder like what the conversations are like with Mariota. Yeah. Um, do they make that move? Do they just say like, nah, screw it. We're playing the vet um, for whatever reasons. Um, and th this, that assumes that the number two pick isn't ready. That assumes that Sam is showing much better, like in questionably better or unquestionably yeah. better than Mariota. So, Which he might, you know, can, honestly. Yeah. Because he, he is, so, he's, he's more time. I think he's, as a thrower, he's more talented. And right. so what, what I would say is that Dan, at least in my experience, has not been married to like, you're, I paid you more money, you're going to be the starter type situations. You know, like he's yeah. not been married to that. So if that does happen, like I could see them keeping Mariota, right? Having that veteran presence in the room, but Sam ends up being the starter. And again, like why, why do we need to constantly like, definitively answer like sometimes it's nice right. to have options and, and hedge a little bit let's keep all three guys and see what happens i'm not saying you're saying anything different yeah but i'm just no but i think out. that's why it's good to have the conversation with you is like you know dan well enough to know that like that's actually a possibility because yeah. i feel like the last staff and to be fair to them many staffs around the nfl would just play the politics game and be like yeah. sorry sam you're you're stuck dude yeah. Um, and you know, obviously quinn was there for like the ultimate version of this he was the dc and not involved in the decision but like 2012, 2013, yeah. Seattle, whatever it was, they signed Matt Flynn to a bunch of money and Russell Wilson kicked his ass in training camp and Russell Wilson went on to be Russell Wilson and Matt Flynn was never really heard of again. Yeah. Um, his paycheck, his bank account's doing nice. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's that's uh, that's good to know and and I think it's something that we'll certainly keep an eye on throughout training camp. I mean, the best case scenario is the number two pick comes in and gets coached looks, up real looks good. Looks like he's ready to go, looks, right? Yeah, and then, and then we're all set. All right, um, then we get to kind of what's left. Um, yeah, or actually, no, real quick. Um, Allegretti on the offensive line and Biotis. Yeah. You're you're an O-line junkie. I'm sorry to make you wait 40-something minutes into a podcast <laughs> to talk about these guys. Uh, what do you what do you make of of those two signings? Yeah, like I talked a little bit about, about Biotis already. And like center to me yeah. is a position. I don't want to say it's like a throwaway position because it's, it's extremely important. But you can kind of get away with like not having – the best athlete there. You need a guy that's got a lot between his ears. I think Biotis is a bigger guy. He's almost 315 pounds, helpful in pass protection, helpful keeping the depth of the pocket. He does have a good feel. There's times where he's a little off balance, but everybody gets a little off balance and pass for every once in a while. I like what he does in the run game, kind of has that edge to him. Um, you know, I think he takes good angles in the run game. All that stuff is important. So I definitely see the potential for him to grow and to blossom into kind of this player that's going to be starting here for the next three years. And again, he started last year for Dallas. So I'm not saying that he hasn't done that, but to kind of fill out and mature right. as a player. I think Algeretti, he reminds me a little bit of like Wes Schweitzer when I watch him, you know, he's like mm. a good football player. Which is player. funny because he got almost an identical contract to what Schweitzer right. got a couple of years ago. He's a tough football player, but to me, I think, you know, and obviously he can grow and mature and I, and I enjoy watching him play. But I do think that there is an element of like you're probably a swing guard, kind of like kind of like with the Nick Gates signing a little bit last year. Like I liked Nick Gates, but he should not have been starting. I I feel like and I, that, that obviously is a better take in retrospect. But I felt like he was going to be the swing player, right? And I feel like Algeretti, while he could come in and play well for you in spot duty, at some point I think is going to be better as kind of that guy that backs up all three spots inside. And so we'll see what happens. And obviously, if he comes out and has a great training camp, like more power to you. But I think like Wes Schweitzer, I think he did some good things in 2000, what was that, the COVID year 21, and then in 2022, struggled a little bit, you know? So I think that's kind of, there. there is potential there. He is a good physical player, but, you know, there are limitations to him, his game athletically, if that makes sense. For sure. Um, but he's the right type of guy. Um, Travis yeah. Kelsey talked about him on New Heights after they won the Super Bowl. He finished the game with a torn uh, UCL, so he's probably yeah. going to miss the entire offseason, which obviously is less than ideal. Um, when you're trying to install a new system and all of that, but, um, the toughness and, and Kelsey was like, that dude, like, has just been great in our room the entire year. Yeah, so Alec Reddy, right kind of guy. Um, and maybe he competes with a guy like Chris Paul, um, by the way, well, great I, I, content, uh, on the commander's YouTube page, uh, Chris Paul talking to Adam Peters down at the senior bowls. They were watching his, his brother. brother. Yeah. 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 Good That's stuff awesome. There. But anyway, you were going to say, no, but I, I think like it's, he's not bad. And Wes was not a bad football player. It's just like, yeah. what is his ceiling? And I, again, like I, I like his film. I think he's a tough dude. <clears throat> Shows up on film too. So like, I think it's a great signing. It's just about role, best fit, best use. And I think those are decisions that Dan, Dan and the staff have to make. Yeah, definitely. All right. So that leaves really receiver and then left tackle uh, to talk yeah. about. Since we're doing O-line, let's, let's tackle tackle first. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> there's plenty of options available. This tackle market has not moved at all. In fact, it has grown. 
DJ yeah. Humphreys, the latest addition, who has a long history with Cliff Kingsbury out in Arizona. I didn't realize how long he's been around. I feel I was like, when that dude drafted like yesterday? Nope. <laughs> he's uh he's 30 now. Uh, he's played yeah. nine years in the league, all all with Arizona. Uh, but DJ Humphreys, former high pick. Um, he could be a guy certainly that comes in, has his Graded out pretty well on PFF uh, pretty recently. Last year, a little bit of a down year. Um, then you got Tyron Smith, who still is Tyron Smith, when or close to what Tyron Smith was at his peak, but uh, you maybe only get him for 13, 14 games. Um, you got uh, Jonah Williams, okay. younger yeah. option. Um, there, there's David Bakhtiari got cut in Green Bay. He's been banged up a ton, but uh, has played at a really high level for a long time. Any of these options? One, do you feel like they need to go here? Can they wait till the draft? two of these <clears throat> options what do you like so yeah i don't know if they need <clears throat> excuse me i don't know if they need to do anything right now but they definitely need to get a player in at the position so i know like um for example like charles leno was signed after the draft right they, they got him in after they drafted sam cosby to play left tackle like they need a player here obviously and so i think it's interesting like tyron smith i think is a little compelling because he was still playing good football last year obviously the injury thing is a concern but like if you were to come in, like you were to draft a guy, like think about it at 36 uh, and 40, like the guys you're talking about are like Kingsley Suamataya, Patrick Paul, guys that are physically freaky, but probably need a year. So like, can they be your swing player for a year? And then, or even like, you know, like, like you were talking about drafting back up into the first round for like an Amarius Mims type guy. Like, let's say you pick him at 25 or whatever. Like he still feels very developmental to me when you watch him. He's only played seven college football games, like physically Oof. freaky, but only played seven yeah. college football games. So why not have a guy like Tyron or Humphreys? Again, Humphreys reminds me a little, I get like a very strong, like Charles Leno vibe. And I mean that as a compliment in that he's like never going to be your top 10 tackle in the NFL, but he's a really, really good, like 15 to 20 player that you can kind of go to the bank on. And Leno got to a point near the end of his career where that was a little bit more challenging for him. But I think right now that's what Humphreys is. So maybe that's the move. And again, you have this kind of really uber talented piece at 36 or 40 that you draft and is your swing guy for a year, but you need somebody, you know, like Donovan Smith. I don't, there's, there's inconsistency with his play that make me go, eh, I don't know if I love that. Some people say Makai Becton is another one, but to me, Makai Becton, because of his injury history, is still basically a rookie. So why would I bring somebody in to kind of hold down the fort that doesn't have the um, that doesn't have the consistency to his play that like a Tyron Smith or a Humphreys or you know even Trent Brown? I think Trent Brown is probably off the table because of the work ethic concerns. But you know, like I I'm bringing a free agent in to kind of give me some peace of mind and give me flexibility in the draft. And again, if I need to sit that young tackle for a year, I can do that. But um, so I think that's the value there. Yeah, no, I lean hard into the veteran guy for a year, two years, and and then take your big swing. And whether that big swing is first round swing or second round swing, uh, that seems to make a lot of sense to me. I would then say receiver is the other position where they they don't have enough guys to field the team right now. Um, <laughs> typically, you want five, six, seven guys in a receiver room. Uh, you want to, you know, last year in camp, it felt like they had ten guys that were NFL quality players and. Uh, I guess some of those guys, technically, like a Bryson Tremaine was on the practice squad all year. Like, did yeah. they sign him to a futures contract? Is he still around? Whatever. Um, they they did, I think, sign Kaz Allen to a futures contract. So, mm -hmm. like, he's on the the ninety man right now. So there are a couple of guys floating around that were kind of in that that didn't make the team uh, crew last year. But Mitchell Tinsley, Deami Brown, and then obviously Jahan Dotson, Terry McLaren are the guys there. And I think there's some really intriguing names on this list that, considering the Commanders still have like sixty million dollars in cap space to play around with. If you want to go sign Hunter Renfro, a dude who just knows how to get open, he professionally gets open and catches footballs, I'm good with that. If you want to go the opposite end of the, the receiver spectrum and go sign a Mike Williams, who's obviously got the familiarity with Anthony Lynn, um, I'm good with that. Go sign the big X receiver. There's plenty of options in the draft as well, but I, I do think there's also something to like, Terry's never really had a vet. And at this mm. point, Terry is a vet, but right. same kind of concept that we've been talking about of can you get you feel like you take some of the burden off of his shoulders um, to to be the man for the franchise and allow him to to learn from someone else like a, like a Mike Williams, um, even though they're pretty close in age. Um, yeah. Like, I, I think that there's there's value there. I think so, too. I, I mean, also, I just think like unlike the tackle market, which is a little bit 
kind of <clears throat> there's not a ton available you know the draft's pretty dense and then there's all these warts with the guys that are free agents you know even though they're talented and i think it would be awesome if they were to sign them at the right price the receiver market to me is just oversaturated at the moment so with regards to making a decision here about this i would wait till after the draft i just think that dra- there's so many good football players at the receiver position like so many it's like there's probably 15 or 20 guys that'll go in the top three rounds, like there's just a lot of good receivers. And so I think there's going to be a lot of good UDFA receivers, right? I think there's going to be guys you get in the fifth round that are like, I'm not kidding, that are going to be able to contribute to your team pretty dramatically, right? Like Javon Baker from UCF, like no one's talking about him, but he's a hell of a football player. So um, I just think wait on this. There's a, there's a plethora of receivers. You know, there's going to be guys that get cut after the draft. Somebody's good. Good's going to be there. Like, I, I think you, this is a, an opportunity for you to kind of be like, hey, like, because there's so many good football players in the draft, in free agency, like, we can either be really selective now and find the right guy for our fit, or we just wait and more good football players are going to be available. I think, you know, kind of combining the draft and then post draft cuts. So, yeah. Um, I also look at Curtis. You know, he's yeah. he had a really good year last year. Like, if, yeah. if the price is right, would I bring Curtis back? Yeah, Renfro, yeah. Williams. Like, there's so many guys that I think are are available that if they're willing to come here, because for whatever, like, they're, I mean, they would subscribe to the, the Zach Ertz quote about Cliff. Cliff will get his guys the ball. And like, <laughs> sure, if you want to sign up now, but if not, you know, there's there's no urgency, which is, that's a great negotiating position to be in. It's like, yeah, we like you, but we don't need you. So mm. you can come at our number or... We'll talk to you later, and if, if you don't right. get anything better, like we'll still be interested, um, right. or we might be. So the, the onus is really on you as as the player. Um, anything else, uh, team wide, positionally, whatever that that we didn't get to? No, I'm just excited. I mean, I'm still excited, honestly, for like the third wave of free agency to come through. You know, because I think there's still opportunities to sign good football players that are going to be impactful, whether it's as like rotational linebackers, tight end, whatever it is, and then you know special teams guys. So the roster building element of this is not done. And it's just, I think it's, it's cool that the process has gone kind of descript so far. And it's just great to see like a plan being executed the way it's being executed. And I just want to see the continuation of that. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, should also see a lot of introductions over the next 36 yes. hours. Uh, so ever I got a lot of guys I was told flew in last night. They're going to, they're going to sign their contracts today, tomorrow. So then you get interviews and press conferences and, and the whole deal. Uh, I don't know exactly how with, with like, they're not going to do a press conference for each guy. Cause there's 15 dudes that signed so far. Um, by the way, Jameson Crowder back. We should mention in the receiver. Yeah. Love that. Um, mm-hmm. you know, always a big JC guy. Um, but you know, whether they're zooms or press conferences, or they just do a day where we all go out there and talk to them in the bubble, uh, kind of like they did the assistant coaches, you know, we'll see what the, the PR staff puts together in Washington, but all the, uh, the official announcements be coming very, very soon. In fact, by the time some of you guys hear this, there will uncertainly, or there will certainly be some that are out. Uh, Logan and I then do for kind of, I guess, I, I kind of feel like we're due for mock draft 3.0 in the next <laughs> two weeks, here. because now yeah. we're, now we're at a, a post free agency situation. So, um, we'll get into that. Um, also got some cool stuff planned for next week as well. More insight on some of these guys coming out in the draft. Uh, so we'll we'll finish up free agency and then go full bore into draft mode as we are now just about six weeks away from the 2024 draft. For Logan, uh, you can find more from on Instagram at Logan underscore Paulson 82. And of course, on the Commander's YouTube page where they are doing all kinds of draft content where Logan is the properly featured star uh, I'm Craig Hoffman, who you can find on the radio, the Team 980, four to seven daily. We also stream that show live on YouTube at the Team 980. And we'll see you next time on Take Command. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs>